Hello world, it's Birdo Prey 5 Kapla, and welcome to my review and first reaction of Star Trek Discovery Season 3, Episode 3, People of Earth. This episode was directed by Jonathan Frakes, aka uh, Commander Riker from Star Trek The Next Generation, and uh, just Will from Star Trek Picard. This episode is also 48 minutes and 31 seconds long, about. Uh, but uh, despite being the shortest episode of the season so far, I'll tell you, it dragged and dragged and dragged. The crew is back together. Michael Burnham has returned to the crew of the USS Discovery. Uh, the first couple episodes, we had one episode that was all Michael, then we had all Discovery without Michael probably would be the best episode of the season. And then, uh, of course, now everybody's back together again. And they're going to journey to Earth, as the title suggests. And uh, the, the, the episode starts with a headache. No, the episode starts with Michael Burnham recording basically a goodbye message to the uh, Discovery. Basically, uh, it's been a year. She's given up her hope of finding them. Now, we don't know this yet, but uh, we learn it as the episode goes. It's been a year. She was just about to give up hope. She was leaving a message for Discovery to find, perhaps, one day. Um, and she was trying to tell them everything she learned. So we get some more exposition about the burn. And somehow they made the burn even worse. Uh, Michael Burnham says that first, all the dilithium just kind of dried up, that they were just running out of dilithium, and that the Federation tried experimenting with alternate alternative warp drives, but they couldn't figure anything out. Yes, they couldn't figure anything out. 700 years past TNG, and they cannot figure out any way to get to warp without warp drive. Which is ridiculous, because we know in the time of Deep Space Nine, Voyager, hell, even Picard, they had plenty of alternatives to warp drive. Not even counting the fact that all Romulan ships, and you're all, you, we know, we know already, Romulan ships don't use uh, dilithium, as far as we know, for warp drive. They use a, a micro-singularity. But forgetting the Romulans for a moment, there were so many other, so many other options to warp drive. The, there was the Voyager species had found that, that drive, and, and the Borg used it in Picard, that they could just beam, basically. They called it, a, what they call it, a slingshot or whatever it was that would just send you, uh, you know, half the galaxy you could travel with this one device. You just walk through the air and you appeared on Nepenthe. Uh, and in Voyager, you would appear halfway across the galaxy. And the Borg said it had a 60,000 light year limit, I believe. 60,000 light years, that's, that's literally halfway plus across the galaxy. So in two walks or two jumps, you could have been anywhere in the galaxy with technology that existed in the year 2399 absolutely in in the alpha beta quadrants and even before that in the delta quadrant nobody else came up with with better tech not to mention we've seen iconian gateways we've seen uh, instantaneous travel hell in in the star trek 2009 films they had uh, an equation that allowed them from to beam from planet to planet Okay, you could beam from Earth to Kronos in the same years of Discovery is happening. Or maybe, maybe 50 years later of the original, before they jumped into the future. So this makes no sense that the burn happened. And, and before the burn even happened, dilithium just kind of dried up. But then, the, after the dilithium became scarce, then all the dilithium became inert, uh, is the word she used causing every starship to just explode. But in, she says all the dilithium. Of course, she ignores the fact that even though all the dilithium in the galaxy became inert, there was still some dilithium that isn't inert and still works, 
which makes no sense. If all the dilithium became inert, then wouldn't all the dilithium be useless? Hell, and we get a scene of like 50 starships that just seem to be next to each other for no apparent reason, just exploding at the same time, just to give us some backfill as she's explaining the burn uh, to everybody. So yeah, it just blew up and they have no alternatives, which is ridiculous. Absolutely, uh, unforgivably ridiculous and moronic. And I'm going to come back to this statement because we're going to have, it it's even gets worse towards the end of the episode as to the, the ridiculousness that we're supposed to believe. Anyway, Michael is still leaving her goodbye message for Discovery. Of course, one of the scenes is little Michael Burnham beating up this big white guy. Uh, you know, it was just a combat simulation, of course. But uh, yeah, she has to get him in a good uppercut, like uh, Mortal Kombat. He goes flying back because, of course, she is the strength of like, what, 300 people because she's Michael Burnham. And he just goes flying back and then the simulation ends. Yeah, we get it. We get it. I get it. Okay. Michael Burnham is beating up the patriarchy. I get it. The white patriarchy. You, you, real, real subtle. Real subtle. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, she, she didn't expect to ever find Discovery. She didn't have any idea where Discovery was going to be. It was just by dumb luck that Discovery happened to come out of the wormhole that she closed a year ago uh, in the general vicinity of her and Booker when it did. Uh, and the Discovery coming out of the wormhole and I guess sending a signal to Michael is what triggered her communicator which she kept next to her, like a cell phone that, you know, doesn't have a, a cell plan anymore. You don't expect to get a phone call, but she kept it with her. And it just so happened to go off as she re was recording this goodbye message. So her, uh, Booker, I guess, they, assuming they, they make a, a, a beeline right for discovery, uh, because this all happened before the end of last episode, then we get to the end of last episode. Michael Burnham shows up on the Discovery View screen. And then literally Michael Burnham, uh, we see her beam to the Discovery. And the entire crew, well, the bridge crew, not the other 88 or however many, maybe 70 people without the bridge crew, suckers that went to the future for Michael Burnham. But the whole bridge crew meets Michael Burnham in the transporter room and literally one by one, everybody on the Discovery hugs Michael Burnham. They all line up to hug Michael Burnham to get, oh my God, the chance to touch Michael Burnham, the woman, the god, the specimen is Michael Burnham. Tilly is, of course, first because she's the fastest person on the ship. She runs up and hugs Michael Burnham and Saru and Dit Ditmer, Dietmer, who, by the way, uh, she's perfectly fine this episode. Last episode, we thought, did she have a concussion? Did she have control, get into her cybernetic implant? Uh, she was acting all weird. Uh, she acted a little weird, but we get no, absolutely zero indication that there's anything physically wrong with her this week. So that, I don't know if that, that uh, plot line has ended or if it's just an ignored plot line whatever um and they all line up to, to to just to touch just to touch michael burnham oh and there's a new blonde woman maybe she was in it last week i didn't notice i notice her now i don't know her name apparently she has a bridge position uh she looks new to me i don't know when she joined the crew but she's there i have no idea her name uh the writers seem to have forgotten that for the crew of the Discovery, I don't know, maybe 12 hours have passed since they made it to the future. There's quite a bit of dialogue between Saru and Michael and Tilly and Michael and, and, and even amongst the, the Discovery crew members themselves that make it seem like they've been gone a year. The Discovery just saw Michael maybe 12 hours ago, okay? The Discovery timeline is... They were at the battle with control. They followed Michael through the wormhole. They came out of the wormhole. They crash landed through an asteroid onto the planet. 
Uh, they had to repair the ship within a day before the parasitic ice got them. Uh, so uh, Saru and Tilly went out exploring, and the people stayed on the ship fixing it. And then they got back. The ice just started getting parasitic and started, whole, you know, uh, growing over the discovery. And Michael Burnham showed up and rescued them. So 12 to, at best, 24 hours. I don't even think a full 24-hour cycle has passed. But let's say perhaps at worst, 24 hours have passed since the Discovery people were literally in their own time. They did not have any year of profound thought. or I mean, people are hugging Mike, uh, Michael Burnham like they haven't seen her in 10 years. Okay, they saw her hours ago. She went through the, the wormhole and they were, they were expecting to see her as soon as they got through. Now, they didn't know she was going to be gone a year, but to them, they just saw her. It doesn't make sense. The writers don't know what they did. And it's like the entire, the entire episode suffers from this disconnect that you have a, an entire crew of people who shouldn't feel like they've been in the future long at all. Uh, but now everybody, because Michael Burnham gave him a little update on what the burn was, now they all feel like they've all been in the future for a year with her. I, I don't, I don't know. I think it's just terrible, terrible writing. Michael says that she sent a message to Terralysium, which means that the planet they are on was not Terralysium, which I thought was a possibility because, let's face it, they said the suit was going to go back to Terralysium. So... I guess they forgot the suit's supposed to be programmed to go back to Terralysium. Anyway, Michael says she sent a message to Terralysium. It took months to get a response, and it turns out they didn't know anything about her mother. What would she send to Terralysium? Hey, do you know about a time-traveling woman in a red angel suit? Uh, perhaps her name is whatever Burnham? You can't, you can't send that message. What message could she have sent? Time travel's illegal. How would she know, how, what did she do to describe her mom? It's ridiculous. I mean, and the fact that the planet answered, like, who answered? Who got that message at Terralysium and says, yeah, I can speak for the whole planet. We have no idea who your mom is. Stop bothering us. Uh, stupid. So um, they basically figure out they got to go to Earth. Uh, they got to go to Earth. Michael, Michael did the only, the only remnant of the Federation she found was a message sent 12 years ago from some admiral. Uh, saying that uh, he'd be waiting for anybody who wants to come back to Earth, uh, that he'd be there. Admiral Saul or, or something. And um, so they figure they got to go to Earth. So Michael makes the uh, suggestion that uh, they... Well, actually, okay, before she makes the suggestion, Saru's like, oh, Michael, we got we to gotta talk in private. And Michael's like, oh, no, Saru, it's okay. You you can be captain. I don't want to be captain. Because before they went to the future, they had this big, they didn't know who was going to be captain because who was technically first officer. So Michael's like, no, you know what, Saru, we don't have to talk in private. I will give you the captaincy. So Michael Burnham gives him the captain's chair like it's hers to give. She just gives it right in, in, in front of all the rest of the crew. She just gives it to... to to, to Saru and like Saru is like oh so the whole crew is happy uh anyway uh so Michael does tell Saru that oh uh the guy who brought me here Booker book whatever Booker Cleveland Booker uh I promised him some dilithium so Saru's like yeah we'll give him some dilithium uh no no problem um okay fine Michael makes a suggestion that they jump oh yeah because they're going to spore jump to Earth, which only makes sense, uh, to spore jump to outside Earth's scanning radius. Uh, this way they don't know that they spore jumped in. And then they'll just pretend to be a ship that was headed home at sublight speeds this whole time, which of course is ridiculous. Uh, they'd have to, you know, it would take thousands of years at sublight speeds to get home from, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, stupid. Uh, so they, that's, where do they jump? Where do they jump? How do they know how far Earth's scanning radius is 930 years in the future? How do they have any clue what Earth's scanning radius is? Michael says she hasn't even been close to Earth 
because she was so far away from Earth, she never got a chance to get to Earth in a year. She never got a chance to get close to Earth. How does she know where Earth's scanning radius ends? So where do they jump? Saturn. They jump right next to Saturn. Saturn is on the view screen. So I guess they assumed that Earth can't scan beyond Saturn. I mean, we have telescopes right now that could scan past Saturn. Okay? I mean, we don't generally keep the Hubble aimed at Saturn. But if we did, we would see potentially a starship just appear out of nowhere next to Saturn. So ridiculous. Uh, they, so they appear next to Saturn, and it gets going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And so then they they impulse it to Earth, and uh, they get to Earth, and and there's a, a force field, and all this crap. Um, uh, there's there's a speech. There's a speech after Burnham gives Saru the captain's chair, where Saru. Uh, you know, talks to everybody and says, you know, we we have the name Discovery. Uh, it's never been more apt, and uh, it's there. It's going to be their job to uh, rebuild the Federation. And I swear, I thought Saru was going to say uh, he was there to make the Federation great again. Mifka, he it, Saru is in total Mifka. Make. The Federation great again, although he uses slightly different words. That's exactly what he meant. They're going to make the Federation great again. So I was I was applauding Saru uh, for that stunning and brave comment. Uh, oh, before they jump, before they jump, there's the worker bees and the robots. You know the droids. They're all fixing the ship. Uh, in case we forgot that the droids existed. I mean, they've been reminding us every episode in the opening credits that the droids are real now and that the droids fix the ship. So why couldn't they have a droid clean up that ooey gooey, uh, you know, residue of a body that they had Gene, the poor guy Gene, shoveling, literally shoveling last episode, poor Gene, shoveling up Leland's dead body parts out of the spore chamber when they could have had a robot do it. But I guess, no, uh, that job is too menial for a robot. We've got to give it to poor Gene. So the robots, the worker bees, they fix the ship. Uh, Tilly and Michael have a conversation. And Tilly's like, you know, I never got to say goodbye to my family and my mother. And, and you know, it's like I just left. I'm like, you idiot. You should have stayed in the past. Why did you come to the future? All of these people. All these people are just now realizing they never got to say goodbye to their family. You know what? You're all assholes. You are all assholes. You left your family for what? For Michael effing Burnham? She forgot about you. She didn't even expect you to come. She was giving you all up for dead. She was moving on with her life. Her and Booker were going to buy a house and raise a family on Nepenthe or something. She didn't give a shit. Tilly just realizes that Michael was actually ready to say goodbye to them all. Michael didn't expect them to come back. Michael didn't expect to see them again. She, she had let them go. She said in her goodbye message that if you love something, you can still love something and let it go. Yeah, F you, Michael. These people, these 88 people, 87, because don't forget, somebody died. They don't tell Michael. They don't tell Michael that somebody died in, in all this. I mean, it's not bad enough that these people lost their friends and family forever, but there's at least one dead uh, just trying to follow her to the future for this ridiculous scheme of, oh, we love Michael Burnham so much, almost 100 people have to give up their lives just so Michael Burnham isn't alone when she gets to the future. Ugh, bullshit. Bullshit. Oh, oh, they, Tilly and Michael, have a, they're talking about all the family. And Tilly's like, is anything even going to be the same? She's like, I just want to go to Earth and, and see something. She's like, do they still have hummingbird cake? What the fuck is hummingbird cake? I've never heard of it. I'm sorry. Maybe it's a thing. But Michael's like, cake is eternal. Oh, and Tilly and Michael bond over cake. Cake being eternal. Oh, oh, and Tilly says, Tilly says to Michael, Michael, I always knew I'd see you again. You saw her 12 hours ago. 
She hasn't been gone that long for you, Tilly. You haven't missed her. She's only been gone a few hours. This is the writers. I'm saying the writers don't understand what they wrote. They don't understand the timeline they're following. Tilly is like, I always knew I'd see you again. Oh, so uh, George U, Philippa George U is using the... Uh, so, so George U just has free reign of the ship, apparently. Nobody gives a shit. Nobody tries to stop her. Nobody, nobody puts her in a brig. Nobody, nobody even watches her. She doesn't have a security guard watching her. She just gets to do whatever she wants, apparently. So she wanted to beam Booker over to the Discovery. So she did. Booker comes on. I don't think he even knew he was going to be beamed on to the Discovery. And Georgie interviews him like a mother would interview her daughter's boyfriend. And she's like, have you guys, you know? And he's like, no, 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 we never did that. And George U's giving him the stink eye, like, yeah, bullshit, you never did that. You, we guys, you know you did that. You know, George U sees right through him. So she's like, oh, you're, you're not, <laughs> Booker's like, well, you're not D uh, Dietmar, meaning because she doesn't have a big metal piece on her head. It's like, and you're not Tilly. And George U's like, I'd rather kill myself. Wow. Wow. Uh, George U in this episode is like the voice of the audience. Uh, brutal honesty at times. Uh, it was the only strong point for for this episode where the the snide remarks uh, Philippa Georgiou makes. Um, I had I had to give some credit for that. Um, so oh uh, so Booker and Michael, uh, they're deciding you know what will really Michael's trying to figure out what she wants to do because everybody on Discovery just assumes Michael's back to stay with Discovery. But George U knows that Michael might want to go out and be on her own and, you know, go with Booker and maybe not want to stay on Discovery. So Booker actually asks Michael, do you feel like you owe these people something? Yeah, you know what she does? She owes them everything. They came to the future for her. She owes them everything. Yes, she owes them. And she should have told you that over the year you guys we're flying around the galaxy together. You tell me she never explained to you that the crew of Discovery made the ridiculous choice to follow her to the future just so she wasn't alone? You're goddamn right. She owes them something. Oh, and, and so how, uh, so, right. So they got to get to Earth, but they want to cloak, cloak uh, their dilithium signature so that Earth doesn't realize they have all this dilithium. But the only way to do that is to give all the discovery to Booker and put it in Booker's ship. But Booker's ship can't, uh, you know, spore drive. But Booker's ship is the perfect size to fit in the discovery shuttle bay. It's just, you know, coincidence. Perfect coincidence that Booker's ship is just as wide and tall as the shuttle bay of the Discovery. So, yay, they could just put Booker ship in the shuttle bay. How, how convenient. How effing convenient is that? So they put Booker ship in the shuttle bay, cloak it, and put all of the dilithium on Discovery into uh, Booker's ship. So it's cloaked, and nobody can see find the dilithium. How is the Discovery generating power without dilithium? Don't ask, because they don't know. They don't know, right? You need antimatter. The whole ship runs on the power created by the matter-antimatter reactor, which requires dilithium. But we are told in no uncertain circumstances that the dilithium, uh, that, the, that the warp core is offline, and that there, there's no dilithium on Discovery. So how do they have power? Nobody, nobody cares. Nobody cares. Um, oh, Saru is not happy with this whole idea of putting all of the all of the dilithium because I mean, di Discovery has like like a planet's worth of dilithium. The amount of dilithium on Discovery, uh, it, you know, would be enough to run half the galaxy. 
uh, they they probably have the single biggest dilithium supply in the entire galaxy right now. It's all on discovery. So Saru, who is now captain, uh, is a little apprehensive about putting this all in Booker's ship. Uh, so Michael's like, well, we could put his ship in the in the shuttle bay, but he had to go in the shuttle bay. There was no there was no other way around it. So Saru says, fine, we'll put in the shuttle bay, but he's going to put guards around the ship. Remember this. He's going to put guards around the ship. And Booker is not going to be allowed in the ship until they get uh, until they get to Earth. And the dilithium is put back into Discovery. Uh, right. So Discovery gets their dilithium back. So they literally say there's going to be guards around the ship until they get the dilithium back. Uh, okay, fine. So they, they go ahead. They're getting ready to make the jump. And, and Booker comes walking onto the bridge. Michael, uh, uh, Saru says hello to him. Michael, uh, you know, calls him over. Booker doesn't say anything to anyone on the ship. They all say, they all say, Booker, Saru offers him greetings. He doesn't even say hello back. He doesn't say thank you. Nice to be here. No, he just walks over, ignores everybody, everybody on the bridge. Uh, yeah, so they jump to Saturn. And one of the, I think it's Ditmar, Ditmar, whatever the hell her name is. She's like, uh, galactic core coordinates. They, they were verifying their position from the galactic core. Saturn is right outside your view screen. You need to verify your position from the galactic core. You're looking at Saturn. Whatever. Whatever. Um, so then they get to Earth. And, uh, yeah, it's got a force field around it. And uh, some ships come up from the surface. And uh, the first thing we get, a, a captain, I don't know, Nadu, Nado, uh, another African-American woman comes up on the view screen. She's from the United Earth Defense Force. And she tells Discovery to leave. They're not, they're not welcome. They're not welcome. Saru is like, but I'm the captain of the USS Discovery. We're a Starfleet ship. She's like, we have no record of, of such a ship. And blah, 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 blah. Uh, basically, uh, United Earth, uh, fine. You want to stay? Uh, United Earth is going to inspect Discovery. So Saru says, fine, you can come aboard and inspect us. We have nothing to hide. Even though they do, they've got all that dilithium they're hiding. And the spore drive they're hiding. But Saru invites them aboard. He thinks he's going to have a few minutes to get ready. No, they insta-beam right through Discovery's shields i guess and just insta beam into discovery and within a second there's dozens of people at holding everybody at phaser at phaser you know phasers out holding everybody at bay uh they instantly appear on the bridge in engineering in uh the mess hall seemingly anywhere there's people gathered plenty of people just just uh insta beam right to wherever all these people are uh Michael Burnham had the foresight to tell Booker to come with her uh, as soon as they started talking to this woman on the view screen. And so Michael Burnham and Booker, who are out of uniform, have enough time to make it to Michael Burnham's quarters. And they both change into uniforms just so that they don't look out of place. Because Michael Burnham, if you're not in uniform, they're going to know you're not part of the crew. And that will, you know, that'll destroy everything. So Michael Burnham, uh, luckily, nobody beams into Michael Burnham's quarters. They give her time to change. Uh, but they beam directly into, into engineering. And Stavitt's like, you know, what, what the hell is this? They don't care. Uh, some guy opens up his palm of his hand. And these three little flying doodads go everywhere. And uh, they start checking. Anyway, so this, this captain for whatever she is, commander from the United Earth Defense Force, she starts telling them about how uh, they could be w working with Wen, W-E-N, and how Wen is a raider and he's, he's attacking Earth all the time looking for dilithium and he's a really bad guy and they have orders to shoot Wen on sight. And um, uh, she also tells them that the Federation and Starfleet, both, the Federation and Starfleet left Earth a hundred years ago. And they're like, so where did they go? She's like, I have no idea where they went. They just left Earth. They didn't tell us where they were going. 
She says it was it was a it was a target to have Starfleet and the Federation still on Earth. So they just decided to leave. Well, in in the last hundred plus years, they rebuilt Earth to be totally self sufficient. And so Saru's like, I don't understand. Are you guys not part of the Federation anymore? And then they get like the the truth blast. Like, no, they're not. Earth dropped. He's like, why should we be part of the Federation? We're self sufficient now. So this, this like, oh, it's like explodes in their head. Earth isn't part of the Federation. Nobody knows where the Federation Starfleet went. They're pretty sure they're out there. They just didn't know where they went. So like, I mean, I don't know. It'd be like, I would say like the White House leaving and like leaving no forwarding address, but it's closer, maybe closer to United Nations, right? Let's say the United States, and I could only dream, kicked out the United Nations. But we didn't know where the United Nations went. We're like, yeah, bye. And they're like, oh, we're going to move to Canada. No, we're not, no, not going to tell you where we're moving. Okay, goodbye. Leave. Get, get out. It, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, but worse, worse, worse than all this. Worse than all this. Back in engineering, one of the people who insta-beams into engineering is our newest, youngest, and probably new title holder for most annoying Trek teenager ever in a series. Yes, Wesley Crusher has been dethroned as the worst teenager in a Star Trek show. We now get uh, Adria, Adira, Adira, Adira. Adira is uh, this is a Stamets thinks what are you 17? She's like, I'm 16. 16 year old genius engineer who is uh inspecting the engineering uh section of uh of the discovery. She's like, why is this connected to the bridge? Why is this that? Why is this that? Shut the fuck up, you stupid little kid. But she's part of the Earth Defense Force somehow, uh, an inspector. And uh, yeah, so we have uh, Adira, and we're gonna find out about Adira in, in a couple minutes. Um, so obviously, uh, the discussions with the uh, with the they beam over the 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 Earth Defense Force beamed over to inspect the ship. Apparently, they're not very good at inspecting because they literally find nothing. They don't find the, this giant ship that's cloaked in the cargo bay, uh, in the shuttle bay of Discovery. They don't find the dilithium. They don't realize the spore drive is anything special. Uh, they're seemingly ready to go, and just they tell Saru not to come to Earth, that he is, you know, you're not allowed to come down, just leave. And they're about to beam over back, but they can't because their personal but transporters aren't working. And why is their personal transport is not working? We don't know right away, but it turns out that Adira sabotaged it uh, while the sh she was supposedly inspecting engineering. She hooked up some technology that would prevent them from beaming back. And uh, we find out later, because she wanted some extra time in the discovery because she was looking for a Federation ship, uh, just like Discovery. Uh, anyway. Of course, when they can't beam out, who comes over? But when, when comes over, uh, the most feared, you know, pirate in, in the sector or whatever, and he demands, uh, you know, he, he well, I don't actually know what he demands, to be honest, because he doesn't know that they have anything. Uh, but he comes over in his ships, they're raiders, and um, the United Earth is like, well, we're going to destroy him. We're, we're going we're gonna to fight. And the Saru is like, no. Uh, and, and for some reason, Michael Burnham and Booker, even though the United Earth see, clearly would have been able to destroy when ships, uh, Michael Burnham and Booker sneak back onto his ship, which is supposed to be under guard, but isn't anymore for whatever reason, and they take off uh, and head towards the Raiders. I don't understand this whole cockamamie plan, uh, and Saru doesn't either. And so on the bridge, a uh, woman says, oh, the, we have an unauthorized shuttle bay launch. And, and meanwhile, the United Earth Defense Force woman is there. And so she doesn't want to say that 
the ship just left with all our dilithium. But Saru's like, come on, <clears throat> say it, Lieutenant, whatever. It's like, the ship left with all our dilithium. And so the United Earth Defense Force was like, dilithium? Well, your future is looking worse and worse. Meanwhile, uh, F Philippa Georgiou is on the bridge talking about how Michael is an unstoppable force and Saru is an unmovable object. And so Michael and Booker keep talking about, oh, do they want to do this or that? Because they're reminding us they had a whole year together. So they're like going through, oh, do you want to pull like a, I don't remember the, the like a Cessna 3. I know they didn't say Cessna 3. But do you want to pull a Cessna 3 or an, uh, you know, Omega 4 or whatever from all the different things they had to do over the year they were couriers? So they settle on a plan. Oh, meanwhile, when is, of course, this, uh, what we assume to be this giant alien wearing this really scary helmet. Uh, but he has a strangely human voice. So it was pretty obvious to me that Wen is just another human with a with a space helmet. Um, and yeah, he, he's, gone, he's going to be. Uh, for some reason, Saru is afraid of starting a war. Uh, the, the United Earth Defense Force says that if they want to destroy, they want to destroy Booker's ship because they don't want Wen to get their hand on the dilithium that's on Booker's ship. So Saru's like, I'm not going to let you destroy the ship. And she's like, well, I'm going to shoot at it. I don't know what to tell you. So they Earth, the Earth itself fires quantum torpedoes. So Saru uh, puts Discovery in between the torpedoes to take the blast of the torpedoes. And to her credit, uh, Ditmar, Dietmar, whatever her name is, she's, she actually questions this. She's like, what are you talking about? We, we just fixed the ship. Now you want to put us in the way of the torpedoes? Uh, not God knows how strong 900 plus future year old future torpedoes are. But uh, Saru's like, yeah, just put us in the way of torpedoes. We've got shields. So, of course, two torpedoes hit Discovery, uh, take out their shields, a uh, lot of damage on the ship. And the woman's like, well, we're going to fire again. And so uh, Georgiou is trying to get Saru to attack Earth. Saru's like, I'm not going to attack Earth. Uh, and meanwhile, Michael Burnham and Booker are talking to this Wen guy on the view screen. They offer him all their dilithium in exchange for leaving them alone. And he's like, that's too good a deal. Nobody does that. And he's like, well, you can either take our dilithium or you can get blown out of the sky because next time those torpedoes are going to hit you, even though they never targeted Wen's ship to begin with. And the United Earth lady tells, tells Saru that if he doesn't get this fight away from Earth, he's going to be responsible for starting a war. But before that, she said they already had standing orders to destroy Wen's ship. So it's like there's already a war between Wen and Earth. But no, Saru, Saru is going to start the war. It, it, none of this makes any sense. Um, while this is happening, or, or, or maybe right after, yeah, right after this is happening, um, Okay, bef before that, let me let me get before that. Uh, so somehow, uh, Michael Burnham and Booker say, "Take our dilithium." Next thing we know, Michael Booker, uh, Michael Booker, Michael Burnham and Booker come through the uh, turbo lift onto the bridge of the Discovery with Wen in tow, and Wen a phaser to Wen, and she's like, "We have a special delivery," and they bring Wen up to the bridge. And so when and the United Earth Defense Force woman uh, are are face to face, although when has a helmet on, and they're like, when was the last time you, time you guys just spoke? And of course they're like, well, they don't. Earth doesn't want to speak. Earth just wants to hoard all the dilithium. They don't even use it. And the United Earth woman's like, they don't want to speak to us. They just kill us. They attack us all the time. So they've never actually spoken. And like like a th like a third grade playground dispute, they're like, you guys have to sit down and talk. And when is being especially a little hard to you know un uncooperative. Uh, and why is that? Well, because George U just kicks him in the leg, knocks him down, and then pulls off his helmet with no regard that he could be an alien that needs that helmet to breathe. He she pulls off his helmet, and of course. He's human. He's a white guy. He's a tall white guy. He looks like he hasn't eaten in months. 
uh, very thin, very tall. He looks like a belter from The Expanse. So who is he? He's a belter from Discovery. He actually lives on Titan. Earth doesn't even talk with Titan anymore. So we're supposed to believe that the United Earth doesn't even leave its, its planet? We can talk to Titan. If we had, if we had a, 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 a probe at Titan, we would talk to it right now. We have spoken to ships at Titan. Not man ships, but we've spoken to ships at Titan. You can do Titan. There's no long distance communication needed. The guy said we lost long distance communication. Fuck you. You can do talk to Titan right now. Yeah, it takes maybe an hour or two for the signal to get there. But that's technology we have right now. That is technology we have right now. How the fuck do they not talk to Titan? They're saying Earth forgot Titan existed. They're like, there was a research station there. You guys cut off from us a hundred years ago. He's like, there was a research station. We had an accident. And we tried to ask for help. And we sent ships. We had no long-range communications. So we sent ships. And you guys blew them up. And she's like, well, we had to maintain strong security borders. Uh, so basically, it's each, you know, they're both responsible for what this has. And thank God for Michael Burnham and Saru and the Federation and Georgiou to force them all to talk. So now that they're all humans, they realize that they can work together again. I cannot believe that 900 plus years in the future, Earth hasn't even gone to Titan anymore. Do they even go to the moon anymore? Apparently not. Because you know what? The, the force shield, the force field was only around the planet Earth. Have we abandoned the moon once again? Okay, I thought only the United States would be dumb enough to abandon the moon. We went there once and we stopped going. But no, Earth itself in the future, in a parody of itself, I guess, decides to abandon the moon again. Because it's only the nearest celestial object to us. But who cares? We don't need the moon. We don't need it. We don't need Titan. We don't need asteroids that have, you know, damn near unlimited wealth to them. No, we don't need anything except Earth. So we put up a, we put a wall. They put a wall around Earth and they were living. You know what? Here's the thing, though. They were living happily ever after on Earth with the wall. So there was really no problems. We got, we got to see Earth uh, because, oh, yeah, the, the captain, whatever the hell her name is, from the United Earth Defense Force, was so impressed with how Saru solved all the galaxy's problems that she gave him special permission to beam everyone down, whoever wanted to go beam to Earth. Uh, she opened up the wall just for him. And they could do whatever they want on Earth. And uh, so, of course, they beam down. And this is the scene where Tilly hugs the tree. And they're, they're at what used to be Starfleet Academy. It's not Starfleet Academy anymore. We get a shot from overhead. It's very futuristic. Uh, the episode ends as they pan out from the tree. And we get to see future San Francisco. And there's buildings flying in midair. Uh, there's water. And it gets further and further and further away. And there it is. The Golden Gate Bridge still exists. 930 years after discovery. The Golden Gate Bridge is still there. And there's a big, big sailing. Not, not sails with sails. But a big ship. Like a water-based ship. A ship that sails the seas. Uh, is going under the bridge, so United Earth still relies on shipping, even though they clearly have some type of anti-gravity technology because they have flying buildings all over the place. But they're still using, you know, ocean-bound ships, so good for them. It's actually a very beautiful picture of future San Francisco. It's one of the nicest pictures of future San Francisco I've ever seen in Trek, uh, and it actually feels like maybe this could be uh, you know, 900, 1,000 years later. Uh, probably the best scene of the episode is this final scene as they cut back from the tree. Um, and 
that's how the episode ends and it's only 48 minutes long and it dragged and dragged and dragged i honestly thought i was watching an hour and 10 minute episode it felt so effing long oh there was also i forgot i forgot to tell you about adria or adira adira isn't all she seems to be adira even though she's human has a trill symbiont in her yes so we don't know adira that's how she knew everything she had a trill symbiont there it is there's the bridge there it is there, that, that's the end of the episode so i guess i've been talking for 48 minutes fuck me uh adira has a trill symbiont in her uh but she can't access all the trills past memories maybe because she's human who knows they don't know but Adira was the admiral who sent the message, who sent the message that Michael Burnham heard that said it was safe to come to Earth. She is Admiral Tal, or she used to be. So now the next episode is they probably are going to go to Trill to figure out why uh, Adira can't speak to her previous hosts. Uh, that appears to be what episode four is going to be about. Uh, but Adira, my God, the new most annoying teenage character in Discovery. It, it boggles my mind that they could make somebody so annoying. They actually uh, elevates Tilly uh, by having this character. Uh, Tilly is no longer the most annoying character. Even though I like Tilly. We all like Tilly. But uh, this, this, this character, my God. My God. Oh, 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 and and I I can't confirm this, but I would bet some sum of money that in we heard it in the episode, okay? We heard it in the episode, the actual message that uh Admiral Tall sends to uh Admiral Tall sends to uh to the galaxy saying, come to the Federation. Uh, come to Earth if you want, you know, if you'll be safe if you come to Earth. It sounded like Leonard Nimoy for, for two seconds. I could have sworn I heard Leonard Nimoy say the Federation still lives. Now, it said in the closed captioning at that scene that it was staticky. Uh, they didn't say who was saying it, but they said staticky. The Federation lives on or the Federation still lives. I, it sounded exactly like Leonard Nimoy. Could they have put in Leonard Nimoy's voice? I think they did. I think they did. I don't know if anybody else picked up on it. I literally have not checked any other reviews. The first thing I did after I watched the episode was watch it a second time. But then I came on and did this. I, I haven't seen anybody else mention this. I haven't seen anybody talk about this episode. I think it's Leonard Nimoy's voice. I could be wrong. Uh, overall, this episode, oh, it was a pain. It hurt. It hurt to get through. The Discovery writers, they're not even consistent within their own goddamn episode. Where were the guards? They said they put guards. There were no guards uh, 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 at Booker's ship. Uh, they don't know. You know, they think that Tilly's like, I missed you so much, Michael. You just saw her, Tilly. You just saw her. It doesn't make any sense. They're terrible. They're terrible writers. This is an awful show. Uh, their best episodes were likely where Michael Burnham was alone and then where Discovery didn't have Michael Burnham to deal with. Those were probably going to be the two best episodes of the season. I honestly, my head hurts. The one redeeming part of this episode was that Philippa Georgiou made the snide remarks I wanted to make at the time she made them. So it's like somebody, somebody somewhere understands what they're doing and they know that this is bullshit and they have Philippa in there just to call them out on their bullshit, but they still do it. So I don't know who, I don't know who writes George U's lines, but they know what they're doing. Almost makes it worse. I, I, again, I hesitate to give this as a score because it's crap. It's crap. Uh, honestly, a two, a two out of 10, I guess. I mean, it's like, could it be worse? Yeah, it could have been, I guess. I guess if I tried hard, I could have made it worse. Uh, but uh, do I want to say it's a one out of 10 uh, and then have nowhere to go? No, I don't want to do that. 
So it was clearly worse than last week, which was a three. So I'm going to give this a two out of 10. And I've got a headache now. And I know I've been talking for so long. And I apologize. But it was just that full of crap. I had to, I had to say it all. Guys, if you enjoyed this review, and it seemed like some of you did from last time, please remember to like the video. Please remember to leave a comment. Uh, subscribe to the channel. 67% of you who are watching these videos are not subscribed. Uh, be a big help just to hit the subscribe button. And of course, hit that bell notification. Otherwise, it's really all for naught. And applaud all. Bird out.